Okay. So, uh, Kanan, let's start with, uh, you know, if you could give us an overview of your journey, what led you up to becoming a partner at Fireside? You know, what, in a way, what made you qualified to be a venture investor, uh, you, you know, based on what you learned in your career and how that defined who you are today? So, it's a long journey, Akshay, and um, somewhere when I look back, lots of different things somewhere added up to where I am. Um, just going back to how my career started, um, I, I got very interested in consumer marketing when I was doing my uh, MBA at uh, IIM Ahmedabad. Before that, I was an engineer and I ran away from engineering. Uh, somewhere, I, I just didn't get it at all. So I was hoping that IIM would be where I would twig what I really enjoyed doing and uh, consumer marketing was it. And uh, so my career took me to uh, Ponds, which at that time was a separate company. And at Ponds, I was in marketing, I was in sales and Ponds got acquired by uh, Unilever globally. So then I was in Hindustan Lever and again in different parts of uh, the lever business. So in personal care and laundry, home care, into the foods business. I did a stint in uh, London in the strategy group. Uh, then I uh, left uh, Unilever and I came on board at uh, Dabur to run their business in India, Nepal, Bangladesh. So got exposure to a whole new set of categories actually. So got into things like juices and uh, all the health stuff. So um, over this, you know, some almost 30 years, I, I saw a lot of uh, FMCG marketing uh, across different uh, categories, addressing different kinds of consumers. So you're talking to women, you're talking to um, people in the rural markets, you're talking to people in different countries. Um, so it was actually uh, an extremely wide, uh, uh, you know, exposure. I'm fond of saying that uh, I have sold some product or the other to some retail outlet in almost every single state in this country. Um, wow. Been on market visits in uh, Kashmir, uh, literally in Kanyakumari, in uh, that part of the country, in Gujarat. So, you know, in the Northeast, I've traveled extensively. So, it gave me a, a, a huge amount of exposure to also uh, what India is about, how all the Indias which are there in India. Um, and, and then I started thinking about, okay, I've done all of this in corporate life and I was getting a bit tired of corporate life. How do I do something more interesting with this? And that's how I left corporate life. Uh, it's like a dozen years back to join a private equity fund. Uh, and private equity funds was just starting to happen in India at that time. Uh, I, I joined uh, something called an operating partner, uh, which was to do with helping companies that the fund was investing in to help them uh, build their business. Uh, and I was with them for uh, several uh, years. Uh, and then Kavaljit Singh, whom I know really well from my Hindustan Lever days, uh, he was raising this fund. And his uh, thesis was about investing in very early stage consumer companies. And, and somewhere I felt that all that I had been um, through, uh, all the exposure to all the Indias, the different cons consumer categories, um, working with a very small company when I was with India Equity Partners, all of it was just coming together in some uh, holistic way uh, into what Kaval was setting out to do. So I came up to him and said, look, I want to work with you on this. And he said, come on board. And that's how I came on board in 2017 as a partner at, uh, at uh, you know, uh, Fireside Ventures. I want to zoom in on the journey before Fireside a little bit. Uh, I have a, a thesis or, I mean, a conjecture that the era in which you were uh, leading sales, like, you know, so I'm talking of like pre-2010 kind of an era, it was more about distribution leading to sales rather than marketing leading to sales? Uh, 
I don't think it is as black or white as, as that. Distribution was vitally important. Uh, but equally, creating strong brands was very important. Uh, building categories was very important. Um, I mean, and, and just think of, let's just take um, Hindustan Lever uh, and, and the kind of categories that they have developed. For example, what used to be called Fair and Lovely was a complete category development uh, job done by the company. Launching a detergent uh, bar, I mean, it was a powder market or a soap market. And then to come in with a detergent bar and create a category around that was again a complete, really great marketing, uh, you know, job. Uh, and I can go on. There have been many, many other things that I think that company did brilliant, uh, brilliantly. Um, so category creation uh, and building strong brands, which, uh, you know, consumers could relate to fighting off competition. Uh, go back to the days when Nirma was on the war path. And I think the wonderful way in which uh, Levers uh, responded uh, with Surf uh, fighting back with the Lalitaji campaign um, and then uh, launching Wheel, learning so many lessons from how Nirma was able to get its pricing right and then figuring out how to translate that into an operating model at uh, uh, Hindustan Lever. So I think all of that was, I think, very vital to the success. But on the other side, you're perfectly right to say selling and distribution uh, was no less uh, important. And uh, I mean, when I was there, we were reaching out to something like 5 lakh retail outlets every single week. And that was an awesome reach, which uh, a Nirma or a Procter & Gamble, who was also at that time entering the country, they had no answer for that. So they had to play where the distribution could allow them to play. Interesting. Uh, is there a science behind category creation? Uh, you know, like you gave examples of uh, HUL creating the fair and lovely, the, the men's fairness cream category, or even the women's fairness cream category, like, like Imami did for men. Uh, is there a science behind that? Like, uh, You know, um, um, I, I think a lot of it at that time at least was about show and tell. And I have been with uh, our uh, sales vans into rural markets. Um, we used to catch hold of uh, one of the kids, typically a boy uh, in the village and uh, find out whether his mother was around and uh, tell his mother, look, we are going to wash this guy's hair now. And open a you know, sachet of Clinique Plus uh, shampoo uh, and wash the guy's uh, hair. And being a boy's hair, you know, easy to wash very quickly. Um, and then uh, ask his mother and mother's friends to come and feel the hair. And they could immediately see how the hair was soft and nice and the hair was shiny and things of that kind. So we've done that kind of show and tell uh, campaigns in umpteen uh, villages. And, and uh, you know, I remember reading uh, Prakash Chandan's uh, book, uh, actually, several books. And he talks about how Dalda was built. Who is Prakash Tandon? Prakash Tandon was the first uh, Indian chairman of Hindustan Lever. We're talking about the 60s. And uh, a great marketer. And uh, he has written extensively about how Hindustan Lever developed categories. And one of the things he talks about was, um, you know, uh, developing Dalda as a brand. And Dalda came in as a fake uh, ghee. That's how people saw it. You know, there was Desi ghee and Videsi ghee. Um, and then how do you convince people that we can make tasty food with uh, Dalda? And Dalda in an era where ghee was uh, scarce and expensive was actually a very good substitute. And he talks about how people used to go into villages and small towns and make uh, puris with uh, Dalda. And, you know, people would taste it. And again, nothing like, you know, eating to really say, okay, this tastes good. Right. So I think uh, at that time, certainly uh, a lot of the category creation was that. But then, you know, we started seeing the power of TV and, uh, you know, 
that whole thing moved to how can you start talking about uh, pain points on TV? And therefore, you started getting TV advertising, which was also about category creation, and talking to people about how uh, the pre-post of one product versus another. Uh, uh, and that started working powerfully with uh, television. Now we are, of course, in a very different era, which is about uh, digital marketing. And here, therefore, the power of content is really um, extremely high. And therefore, when you go on to um, Meta or you go into Google and so on, people are looking to see reviews. People are looking to see what is the content that you have provided. And I think all of that uh, has become the way people are looking at to buy into new categories. So uh, the science has changed over the decades. Hmm. Uh, how does a large company like HUL or Dabur think about its portfolio of brands? Uh, because, I mean, you know, there would be some attempt at creating new brands versus acquiring brands. Uh, and so, so, you know, what is the way in which they think about the portfolio? What are some of the learnings you've had? So actually very different, the two uh, companies. And let me try and contrast those for you. Um, Unilever and Hindustan Lever, um, uh, or, or for that matter, like a Procter & Gamble and so on, they are very uh, focused on uh, category shares. So they take a category, let's call it uh, shampoo, and then look at how to segment the market and how to have a brand in each segment. And most of the brands are specific to just that product category. So if you have a sun silk, for example, at best, you might have a sun silk shampoo and a conditioner, right? But you wouldn't have a sun silk soap, you wouldn't have a sun silk um, face cream or anything of that kind. A notable exception to that in the lever uh, portfolio is uh, Dove. And Dove actually broke many of those rules and we're going back like 20 years. Dove uh, for a long time was just that bar, right? Which was not a soap, right? And it was one fourth moisturizing cream, et cetera, et cetera. But outside some markets where it was a big success, it never did particularly well. Uh, then actually Unilever broke its own self-imposed rules that brand should operate within a category to say, look, actually there is something bigger sitting inside Dove, which is this whole notion of it is very gentle and it's very, uh, it doesn't damage uh, and so on. And that was a worry that lots of consumers had. So then Dove broke into shampoo, Dove broke into deodorants, and therefore it actually was became a multi-category uh, brand. But that was quite a counter Unilever uh, gospel of how brands should work. Dove, on the other hand, actually thought like Dove did in the, in the 2000s. Dove said, look, we are uh, about Ayurveda. And it started off uh, as a pharmacy started by Dr. Burman in Kolkata some 130, 140 years back. Uh, and from there, they said, okay, we're going to launch product. They launched all the very traditional Ayurvedic medicines. And they built this whole consumer uh, trust around Dava's knowledge of Ayurveda. And then they started moving that into personal care where first, I think, uh, Lal Dantamanjan. Then they launched Dabar Amla, um, and then moved into toothpaste. Uh, so moved across categories with the core Dabar brand. Then they spun off sub-brands like Batika and uh, things like that. So the Dabar journey was really always uh, cross-category because they were working from a core competence that consumers uh, trusted Dabar for. So the journeys were very, the origins of the journeys were very different. And therefore, the brands were built very differently. And therefore, um, when Dabur looks to acquire, as they have acquired several brands in India, they're looking to acquire brands where uh, that Ayurvedic uh, provenance is, is not going to play very strongly. For example, they acquired uh, Femme. And Femme was into, uh, you know, bleaching, right? It's a face bleach. 
And that's not what Ayurveda is ever going to do. But Dabur wanted to build up its skin portfolio, and so they acquired uh, that. Um, Unilever, on the other hand, has actually been a very acquisitive company. I'm talking Unilever. Um, and there are very few brands which were originally uh, Unilever. You know, you could think of Lifebuoy as one of those, or Sunlight as one of those. Um, but apart from that, there are very few organically, I mean, Fair and Lovely was one of them. But almost everything else was acquired, right? Um, so it, it, it's been a very acquisitive company and built its portfolio. Uh, and it's played its portfolio very uh, interestingly over the years. So I, I don't know if you're aware, but um, if you read the history of Unilever, it used to at one time own a vacuum cleaner company. Uh, it wow. used to own oil plantations in Nigeria because, you know, palm oil was very important for making soaps. It used to have uh, own a company in the Middle East which uh, retailed alcohol, right? Wow. So it was a conglomerate like, you know, all the old uh, conglomerates. It was in everything. It was in a country. It had a strong presence in a country. It had a country management. So they did all the business they could do in that country. But then over time, the market started challenging the notion of a conglomerate. So they started divesting many of these businesses and keeping on thinking about what is really core. And then they same said, like, uh, I think somewhere about 25 years back, um, they sold off their chemical business, they sold off their perfume business, um, they sold off their uh, tennis racket business. Um, and they said, we are about FMCG. We are consumer, we are consumer brands. Then again, that had to be tightened further to say, okay, you know, uh, are you an owner of consumer brands or are you a manager of consumer brands? That was a question coming from the market. Because at that time, Unilever had 2,000 What's the difference brands. here, like owner and manager? In the sense that you keep owning brands and let the brands do whatever they want. If you come to India and say, okay, let's buy something in uh, India. Uh, whereas a manager of the brands says, I got Dove. How do I take Dove to India? How do I take Dove to, you know, XYZ country? How do I move Dove into shampoos? How do I move Dove there? So I'm managing the brand actively on a global basis. Whereas an owner says, okay, you got fair and lovely. Okay, you do whatever you want with it. Right? And this question was being asked because uh, Unilever had, at that time, something like, if I remember right, 2,000 brands. And the market said, you can't manage 2,000 brands. So then they uh, introspected and then they said, look, uh, we're going to manage actively 200 brands. It's also a large number. But we're going to have uh, these brands calibrated as global brands and regional brands. And we'll have a way of managing each one of these. We'll have an expertise center. We'll have a, a product development program, which will either be regional or global, depending on the nature of the brand. And those are the only brands we're going to manage. Every other brand, we're either going to sell or we're going to divest. Or we're just going to allow it to die. Right? So they became, therefore, a, a global brand manager in that process. Um, uh, then the next uh, thing was to look at what categories you are playing in. And that's something, again, like Unilever has consistently done over the years. So at one time, they used to own a lot of frozen pro products like frozen peas, fish fingers, and all that under the bird's eye name. So they said that, look, frozen food is not where the consumer is going. The consumer is buying more of chilled food. Um, so let's get rid of the frozen food business. So somewhere about 20 years back, they sold the frozen foods business. Uh, then they had a whole uh, business around uh, cooking fats, you know, margarine and oils and stuff like that. A very large uh, business, largely uh, centered around Europe, but they had other bits and pieces like Dalda here and so on. So again, they said that that's a business which is uh, flatlining, won't grow very much in the future, very good margins, but we're going to uh, exit that. So they sold that a few years back. Uh, more recently, they sold the tea business in most countries, except I think India and Indonesia. You know, brands like Brookborn and Lipton, because they felt that consumers were shifting more to coffee 
and therefore this was going to be a slower uh, growing business so they have been very active portfolio managers uh, whereas you don't see that with dabur dabur has continued to grow organically acquired a few things but they don't think of, of themselves as portfolio managers and uh, fairly dispassionate i mean to sell off lipton which is such an iconic unilever brand uh, I, i mean it, it needs to have a real amount i mean a real objective look at your portfolio to be able to take such decisions absolutely and uh, i mean one of the reasons they do that is lipton was also acquired brookbond was acquired so what you buy you can also sell right okay okay uh, why is unilever called the ceo factory um um you know i, I would ascribe the title spe- more specifically to hindu sun lever yeah because uh, i mean the the again proof of the pudding is the eating i think the number of uh, people who have led uh, companies in india and outside india it, it's a staggering uh, number and therefore there is a method to uh, why that happens i don't think it's just that they spend time at uh, hindustan lever uh, i think uh, there is Uh, 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 a lot of attention paid to whom you recruit uh, and once you recruit uh, what goes into developing them and that's not just about training programs and global exposure and so on but it's also uh, how you develop them at least in my times out there it was a very judgmental company you're being evaluated all the time right i have never known a, any company to keep thinking about is that person going to cut it right that person has this strength but you know what this thing is not you know the best thing you could have done right so there is always a constant spotlight is on an every uh, manager in that um, company They, they looked at talent the way they looked at brands like you know oh, yeah, they, they yeah. have a portfolio of talent to manage and uh, you know no, amazing very much and there is a development program therefore people move uh, into different jobs uh, and each job is a testing ground for uh, you so i think that uh, and uh, like you you have had a great year wonderful you know pat on the back but the clock is reset and the clock starts all over again so you know you're again on the treadmill having to prove yourself uh the company adds a lot of value because of all of this because um there are, there is a lot of talent all around you so you have to rise up to that uh, talent and even without being very conscious of it you are raising your game all the time right and so for this whole uh, uh, environment where it's about evaluation it's about being sur- surrounded by talented people um just just means that you your game is you know you're pushing yourself uh, and therefore you think you're pushing yourself to think uh, ahead to think uh, outward and i think that's why that what's that, that's what good ceos do amazing uh what were you managing at india equity partners which company uh so uh there was this company called innovative foods uh which i helped them acquire this is a frozen foods uh, company out of uh cochin and uh, so i was spending half my time running that company as the ceo and i was spending uh, another half of my time looking for new deals okay okay A- and you were a general partner at india equity partners i was an operating partner at india equity partners what is the difference between a gp and a the the, the gps are the people who raise the fund okay so they are, they are the guys who get together and uh, you know form the fund uh, they are the people who administer the fund they are the people who finally take the call on where the money is to be invested uh also when there's time to divest so they are the people who are answerable to the limited partners who are the investors the operating partners are the people who work with the gps 
uh, to help them better, once they've done an investment, to look at how to scale up the business, how to get the right uh, things happening in that uh, business. So they tend so, to have much more of a, a sectoral um, experience. A, a GP then it would be like a co-founder in, in, in that sense, like the co-founders need of... Not a, be, need not be a co-founder, but can be... A co-founder is always a GP, uh, but a GP right. need not necessarily be a co-founder. Okay, understood. Okay. And... Uh, do operating partners also get uh, a stake? In it? This is essentially the way partners of a private equity get uh, compensated is through a profit share plus some salary because they charge a management fees from the LP. So that gives them some salary, but that's not the main compensation. I, I guess the profit share is the main compensation for partners. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's called the carry. And carry is linked to the uh, the gains that uh, the limited partners make. So, you know, um, investing, whether it's private equity or venture capital, is, has got two features which are very different to public markets. One, it's far riskier, uh, and uh, it, uh, has, um, it, it has long time horizons. And so it's not a very liquid uh, asset, right? So the limited partners need to ensure that um, the, the GPs are making the right calls and are uh, seeing the companies through over a long time period and therefore they're looking for alignment of interests. And that's why uh, a share of profit uh, is something which is uh, very much what they would like uh, uh, the, the GPs to, to uh, factor in as the main element of compensation. And uh, operating partners also get similarly compensated or uh, is there a difference? So there are varying models uh, out here, Akshay. And, and I think, again, depends upon uh, which private equity uh, firm uh, you're talking to. Some will uh, uh, offer, uh, you know, a share of the to the operating partners because of the same reason that you want to have alignment. And the alignment is not about just taking a, a fee or a salary. And after a year or two, you get something better and you move on. So they want people to stay the course and therefore uh, a is a good way of getting that alignment. But some might be saying that, look, uh, we just, uh, you know, getting an expertise uh, on a as required basis and not really as a full-time commitment. Uh, and there it may be more of a fee kind of a structure. Okay. What was the lens with which you were evaluating acquisitions when you were in PE? And I'm sure it would have changed when you joined Fireside as a VC. So just help me understand the PE lens versus the VC lens for investing slash acquiring. Uh, I mean, um, you know, the, the risk profile of a PE is very different to that of a VC, and that's a fundamental uh, difference in how we look at uh, selecting deals. Uh, a, a, a VC model is that you do uh, a, a lot of deals, right? If you take a fund one, for example, we done we did 18 deals, okay? Uh, and, and therefore, there is a, a scatter in terms of outcomes. Um, some companies will do very well. For example, Honasa is one of our fund one uh, uh, companies, which has done uh, spectacularly well. Some companies will not succeed. And that's, uh, that's part of the risk which is built into the VC model. And, and some companies will uh, deliver good returns, but nothing as spectacular as uh, uh, Honasa kind of thing. So you're uh, building a portfolio where there'll be diverse outcomes. On the whole, it'll be uh, a good outcome is the expectation, right? Um, and uh, therefore you're taking relatively smaller bets, but you're taking more bets. Uh, the private equity model is saying that, look, um, I'm investing in a company which I don't expect to completely fail, right? Uh, I expect it to grow in a certain way and then uh, to exit with a certain, uh, you know, financial outcome. 
that growth may or may not happen at the pace at which I expect it to happen, right? And therefore, uh, the um, uh, the the risk is more uh, of uh, how fast the portfolio scales, and also at how it is valued when I exit, rather than having uh, a significant proportion of the companies which uh, just close down. So it's a very different risk profile. Therefore, when you are at a private equity firm, you're typically saying, okay, here is this uh, firm that I want to invest in. It is uh, doing well or doing badly. If it is doing well, um, is it going to do as well for the next four or five years? And therefore, can I expect to deliver, you know, a 3x or 4x on that when I exit. Or a companies that I'm investing in, it is significant, it has built some credibility with the market, let's say consumer market, and uh, it is not doing well. Can I put in uh, money? Can I make some changes in management or can I get in uh, external help to change certain things that they're doing to actually then change the trajectory of the company? So those are the interventions that you're talking about. With a VC, we're coming in and saying, look, we like the founder or founders. We think that they have what it takes to build a large business. And that's very important in our game that we're not coming in and saying, hey, let's change the CEO. We don't want to do that, right? So we're coming in and saying, here is a founding team that we really like. We think that uh, they can build a large business. Uh, we think they have a great uh, idea, uh, which is solving a large business, therefore, large uh, problem. We think, therefore, this can be a, a business of some scale. Um, and um, they can be reasonably frugal with capital in the model that they have. And that's our particular um, you know, liking for companies which are frugal. Not all VCs. Uh, are that way. Um, so we we think there is a good op business opportunity which can be scaled and a founding team which can scale it and capital frugality. So we say, okay, let's do the deal. Um, so we'll do many deals in a year. A private equity firm will do a lot more research and do fewer deals per year. Uh, why did you acquire Infinity Foods for India Equity Partners? Innovative what Foods. Was innovative Foods, sorry. Yeah. So what was the um, lens I, I think which the, it was evaluated? The lens was saying that, look, uh, frozen foods is uh, going to develop in India. Uh, and it's still a very um, nascent uh, category. Um, and therefore, there is a growth opportunity. Uh, there aren't many companies operating out here. So if you can invest in this company and grow it to some scale, then there could be uh, acquisitive interest, uh, not necessarily from Indian uh, companies, but potentially from uh, you know, overseas uh, companies as well, who would want uh, to have an asset in India which has distribution, uh, manufacturing capabilities, et cetera. And uh, is uh, Innovative Foods uh, acquired or is it still an independent uh, PE-owned business? Or uh, To the best of my knowledge, it is still a PE-owned uh, business. Hmm. Okay, understood. Okay. So uh, tell me about uh, the fireside journey when you joined. Uh, you must have had to do some amount of unlearning and relearning uh, you know, you know. Tell me about those uh, initial deals that you signed up on. Uh, you might have made some mistakes also in some of the deals. Like, like you know, what were some of your learnings there? I mean, um, several things. I think the first thing is um, the speed at which you make deals. Right. Uh, there are many unanswered questions, um, but you have to trust your experience and your intuition. Uh, and then take a call. Take a call to do the deal or not do the deal, right? So uh, I, I, the amount of data you might have seen uh, when you were at Dabur or in the Sunliver, 
and even in a private equity firm, you're not going to find that kind of information. Because you're investing in companies which are doing maybe 30 lakhs a month, 40 lakhs a month. Now you're sitting out there and then you're saying, is this going to be a 500 crore company? Uh, and to take that call, data is not going to give you much of an answer. Right? So you're trusting to your experience of how this uh, can work out. And you're trusting to your experience of human beings to say this founding team can work out. So that relying a lot more on intuition is, is a big change when you move into a firm like ours, which is working at very early uh, stages. Um, the second thing is uh, you realize quickly that um, putting in money is just not enough. There is a lot of uh, support that uh, a young company requires uh, with the best of founders because uh, you know, you're getting in great founders who might have worked in great companies before or, or, or actually led uh, or started uh, other startups earlier but they still have big gaps in how uh, they can uh, you know, approach this whole thing. With the best of founders, they still have large gaps in their understanding of how to uh, scale a business. Uh, and so we had to build, very actively build an ecosystem. Uh, in many ways, this was sort of a missionary thing. For example, we talked to, I remember, um, Meta. And we told them that, look, you guys don't have a human being that uh, young companies like ours can talk to if they have a problem. Uh, and when we had to talk to them about what the business opportunity is, if they were to have a team dedicated to young companies. Um, and they saw the business sense. And I think actually within a year, they put up a separate SME vertical. And that really helped a lot of companies, both at Fireside and outside Fireside. So in that way, we worked with Amazon, we worked with Flipkart, we worked with Big Basket, uh, with Google, to really help them understand how to shape their engagement with young companies. Now you can ask, why would a Google want to work with uh, young companies uh, or why, with Fireside? Uh, and the reason is simple, because we were consumer focused. We were going to them with issues facing or opportunities in 10 different companies. And when you're talking about 10 companies, they know that this could be something which could impact 100 companies. So we're talking to them about something which had an impact at scale. And so they're very happy to talk to us and uh, uh, you know, try to figure out uh, solutions which could be more appropriate for young companies. Similarly, we worked on governance because, uh, again, you, you know, you're, you're, when you come in, you got a uh, set of accounts, which has been audited by, you know, an accountant whom the market doesn't know. Uh, maybe a very good uh, auditor, but at the same time, uh, it lacks credibility. Uh, so we actually approached the big four guys and said, look, can you start auditing uh, some of these companies? And this is not typically what the big four guys do. But today, pretty much all our companies are audited by uh, one of the big four uh, firms. And therefore, when the next level auditor comes in, the next level uh, investor comes in, and they see a set of accounts which has been audited by EY or KPMG, that immediately builds credibility and takes one of the issues out of the equation, right? So I think there is a whole lot of things that we had to do to, to uh, build, uh, to give support to the founders of our uh, company. So that was a big change uh, from working for, let's say, a, a private equity firm. The third thing is uh, really, um, how do you work with founders? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I come from a background of having led large teams, large businesses, uh, and from very hierarchical firms, right? And then you, you suddenly have to change uh, your, your style completely because you are now in a situation where you are backing the founders, right? And therefore, if the founder wants to do something 
and you think it's a bad idea. How do you get that founder to see your point of view? Because you, you, you don't want to lay down the law. Though technically you can, because you have all kinds of rights that the lawyers have got for you. But that's no way to build a constructive engagement, right? So you have to think about ways of convincing uh, founders. Uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, when it doesn't work, you've got to think about how, you know, it, this could have consequences. And how do you limit the consequences, right? So it's, it's a whole new ways of actually engaging, uh, which has been very interesting for me personally as well, because it's my own development uh, in this way too. Yeah, it's, it's like how as parents, we have to learn to change our parenting style once the kids grow up. <laughs> Something similar would be happening here, I guess. In many ways, yeah. So. Uh, what were some of the early deals you did? And, you know, do you have uh, like deals where you made a judgment which turned out to be wrong and what you learned from them? Uh, is, like, you know, how much of your decision is based on your understanding of market versus your understanding of founders? To me, both uh, matter, Akshay. Um for example, one of the earliest deals that I did was with uh, to invest in Kapiva. Yeah. Now, uh, Kapiva is into uh, Ayurvedic products. And uh, I, I've known uh, Amit for a long time. Amit comes from the Baidyanath uh, family. And from a Dava days, I've, I've uh, kind of uh, known him and so on. Practice journey, went to India, joined McKinsey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I, I, I felt that he had what it takes to build a large business. Uh, but equally, I was pretty convinced that uh, there was a, 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 a very high level of relevance uh, for Ayurveda in with uh, today's consumers. But he just got to communicate everything very differently. And I knew that that's what Ami was setting out to do, right? Um, so that was one of the earlier deals that I um, did. Um, one of the deals I was involved with uh, was with uh, Yoga Bar, right? This was a deal actually that Kaval had done as a personal deal even before uh, we set up the fund. Then when we set up the fund and we uh, were thinking of investing, Yoga Bar came up investment, we decided to invest. And I came on the board. Um, and there again, uh, working with Swasni and Anindita to build what is actually a very, very interesting brand, the food space. Um, that was again interesting. Again, a high level of uh, conviction around the founders and on uh, the thesis, right? So for me, both I think are, are, are actually extremely uh, important. Has there been an evolution in? Uh how you evaluate uh, deals from when you joined uh, and to where it is today. Like, you know, you said that you had to learn to rely on your intuition more. Is it still as much intuition or, uh, you know, are there more scientific uh, interventions as well which help decide your judgment today? So, uh, uh, the intuition goes at, at an earlier level today. Uh, one of the things we've done at Fireside is consciously we've built now a large team, which is sector focus. And one of the things we want the sector focus team to do is to actually research different parts of each sector. So if you, for example, take the whole food area, there are so many different uh, types of foods out there. So we uh, want the team to be researching each uh, area. And then uh, we get them to look at building a thesis for each of the sectors. And the thesis involves trying to understand what is changing in that sector. So what are the forces which are reshaping that sector? And for us, those forces uh, should not be very strong forces at a point in time. 
should be relatively weak forces because, you know, we are early stage. If it is uh, such a strong force that uh, McKinsey is calling it out, then we know that's not our deal, right? So now, how do you identify the weak forces? So that's where I think a lot of the intuition starts coming in. And we say, okay, this kind of a, a force could be reshaping this sector. So it isn't has reshaped, but could be reshaping. I mean, let me give an example, the whole area of uh, supplements, right? I mean, now we have done, uh, including Kapiva, three deals in the supplement space, okay? So we got uh, Kapiva, we got Wellbeing Nutrition, we got the Good Bug. And our intuition has been that um, the supplements business in India is totally underdeveloped. Um, and that's because uh, people of a certain generation relied entirely on doctor's prescription. You know, at a certain stage in life, the doctor says, you got to take all these pills and half the pills of vitamins, right? Uh, but with, with Google and uh, all of that, that has changed. People are reading a lot more, getting a lot more uh, informed about nutrition. And therefore, they want to, to avoid going to a doctor. They are looking at what they should supplement. And that was our intuition. And that intuition only got strengthened with COVID. So basis that intuition, we started you know, looking at what could be happening in the supplements area, what kind of interesting strategies are there. And that's how we invested out here. Okay. Yeah. okay. We found these three, perhaps the most uh, innovative supplements businesses. Uh, can you also share some wrong decisions you took? Uh, you, you may not want to publicly air them too much, but maybe your anti-portfolio or something like, like stuff which uh, like you learned later on that, okay, that was a wrong call. Yeah, I mean, I cannot name names. Uh, but, but there have been uh, businesses which have uh, scaled. Uh, for example, there was a whole uh, business in the appliance area. Yeah. And when they came to pitch to us, they were talking about a certain technology uh, basis which, uh, you know, they thought the business would scale. And, like a DLDC uh, our understanding technology was, or something like that. Uh, no okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are many technologies right. out there. And you're going to take a guess on what technology is going to be there. And uh, we felt that that technology by itself was uh, not really new and could be replicated. Um, and I think that business is scale. So clearly that is something which certainly is in our anti-portfolio. Um, yeah, and there are other businesses that perhaps we started talking to them a bit too late. Uh, and that's why we're really pushing hard on saying create thesis. Uh, you know, the, the prepared mind, right, is important. And with a prepared mind, then you go and search for deals rather than let the deals come through the door. We really want to have more and more of our deals, deal deals where we have done the outreach rather than somebody coming in and say, hey, Faisal, do you want to invest? Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, what advice do you have for founders who want to raise from Fireside? What's the way in which you evaluate the founders, you know, things which they can be prepared for? So I, I think the first thing we want to tell founders is don't wait till all the, the, what, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. We are happy to talk to you at a very early stage. Okay. I mean, we have talked to companies for several months uh, and, uh, you know, and try to really help them understand how to make themselves uh, investor ready. Right. We are very, very uh, interested in doing that. And then we felt that, okay, they are ready to take an investment. Then we have invested. So I think the first thing is, if you think that you're doing something in the consumer area uh, that can scale, don't wait for a long time to make a lot of mistakes uh, or be worried about getting rejected by Fireside, et cetera. 
just come talk to us we're happy to talk to you if we think this is half interesting we're happy to engage with you okay um the the uh, uh second uh, piece is really to think about you know what is your motivation right uh we are very convinced that in the consumer area uh you can't build great businesses by just throwing money at problems right this is not an eyeballs footfalls whatever kind of a game right if your product isn't good you can create lots of people who buy it once and then don't buy it again right but therefore you got to fix the product and whatever it takes you got to fix it right if uh, your propositioning to the consumer is incorrect you got to fix that right you can't just say i will spend 3x amount of money so uh, uh, in the consumer game we believe for most of the companies we invested in that these can make money fairly quickly uh, and money is made by repeat purchase money is made by customer love right so founders who are thinking uh, consumer first uh, you know who really put the consumer somewhere at the heart of what they're doing keep thinking about how to make the consumers happier uh, keep trying to understand the consumers get new insights and develop product based on those insights we love those founders right um the other thing that is uh, very important to us is fireside is uh, the whole planet first philosophy right i mean inherently consumption is polluting right and to some degree or the other because you're going to use some plastic you're going to use some chemical something um so consumption has uh effects our view is that uh, you know th- there are certain industries that we won't invest in uh you know we don't invest in alcohol if somebody wants to sell a better gun don't come to us so there are certain things that we won't uh, do but having said that uh what we want to do is work with founders to think about how from wherever they are how they can reduce the impact of the planet right can they reduce the amount of plastic can they reduce their carbon footprints um so even at a very young stage we believe that it's something that if founders start thinking through uh it should be possible for them to have a better impact on the planet and i think uh, we find that in the companies that we invest in in general the founders are very very happy to uh to do that because i think they come from a generation uh which wants to live the planet a better place yeah uh and similarly i think in terms of how they are building the workplace uh we do believe that uh in today's environment uh a successful workplace is more inclusive is more diverse um has got good healthy policies uh, wants to have um motivated employees um uh, and therefore there is a whole bunch of uh workplace practices which we think need to be there in order to create very strong workplaces which will help the founders succeed so we are looking for founders who have a similar a uh, belief uh, system out there and obviously to to the whole esg piece the governance piece again is super super important if you even get a whiff of uh, a founder thinking about you know sneaking away revenues from the tax guys and so on we just take clear for us uh, that integrity is we play by the rules we want founders to play by the rules and within the rules we believe we can succeed and we don't need to do anything which is not compliant and then want success i, I think that's not what we have uh, all uh, signed up for and we want companies which are very very um, uh, clear about the founders which are very very clear about uh, that how do you uh, 
evaluate the founders? Is it through like one-on-one -on -one interactions or is it by looking at the data about their, for example, repeat purchase would show customer love and so on? Or, or you know, like what is the, what are the different ways in which you evaluate uh, a team which comes to you? So, uh, in fact, this is something that we keep, keep talking about. How can we improve uh, this whole thing? Because this is so important, right? We even at one, one point in time said, should we talk to a professional firm to actually do an assessment? And we thought many founders would feel insulted, right? Um, uh, and also the fact is that when we think about when we look at successful founders in a portfolio, they come in all sizes and shapes, right? So I can't do one identity kit and say, a kit and say this is what it is, right? I mean, I take a, a Varun Alag and I take a, an Abhiv Sharma and I take a, an Aman Gupta and I take a Suhasni Sampat. I mean, they are all each successful uh, people but very, very different personalities and very, very different ways of having generated that uh, success, right? So I can't just reduce it to a formula, right? So we do two, three uh, things, Akshay. Um, first is uh, that, that there is a, uh, we talk to people who know the founders. Typically, these might be people they have uh, worked with in their earlier professional career, or in their earlier startup career and so on. And that's one good source of, uh, you know, understanding. And here we're not trying to evaluate the founder, we are really trying to understand the founder. We want to understand whether this is going to be a successful relationship. If it is not a successful relationship of Fireside, it may be a successful relationship elsewhere because every venture capitalist is also different, right? So we. We're not trying to evaluate, we're trying to judge uh, fit. Um, we, are, uh, we talk to people who would know the founders. We talk to angel investors who would therefore have spent time with them. Um, we as partners spend uh, face time. There would be at least two to three partners out of the four who would have had long conversations with the founders. And we're really trying to understand how they think, what is motivating them, how they would behave in different situations, and sort of somewhere how they relate to, relate to our experience of leadership, right? And it helps that all four of us that come from strong operating experiences in uh, large uh, enterprises. So we've seen a, lot, a bunch of uh, you know, leader, uh, leaders in action. Uh, and of course, we uh, every before every investment, uh, the founders do come to Fireside, the office, and meet our entire team. Right. So yeah, I think uh, we we really try to work hard to assess uh, fit. Got it. Okay. So uh, would it be fair to say that a company would have already done the zero to one journey when they come to you, and you have them in the one to ten and the ten to hundred uh, journey? Uh, I, I think that's a fair uh, assessment. Uh, having said which, we have done some investments where uh, there was no revenue, but we knew that the products were there. There was some kind of a beta thing going on, like Gynoveda, for example. When we invested, there was no revenue, but we had such a strong view on the founders and on the thesis. We said, look, you know, let, let's sign up for this and uh, ride it from here. But more typically, it's been like when they are at that one to 10 kind of a journey, that's when we uh, find that uh, they have uh, learned some lessons along the way. Uh, there is therefore some greater clarity of uh, thought. Uh, and that's typically, I think, where we have seen, seen that happening. Then we really work with them on the 10 to 100, and now we are working on the 100 to 500 piece. Okay, interesting. Uh, do you have uh, like some playbooks that you share with founders for the 10 to 100 and the 100 to 500 journey? Uh, we do, and we are working on more of them. So on the 10 to 100 piece, uh, we have written uh, playbooks on 
how to engage with Amazon, how to engage with Big Basket. Uh, we have uh, active conversations with Meta and with Google so that uh, you know, we can help our companies understand uh, what is the right engagement model with them, right? Uh, we also uh, have active relationships with uh, other uh, channel players like a Swiggy or a Blinkit. So there is, uh, you know, there is anchoring of all those relationships within Fireside. So within Fireside, we try to be as seamless as possible uh, so that let's say X is on the deal team, but Y anchors the relationship with Blinkit, right? And we know that X requires uh, that connection. X talks to Y and makes the connection all happen. So there are playbooks and there are the relationships which work to the advantage of the companies. Uh, we're now looking to see how to strengthen that engagement uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophy and uh, method to really a stronger playbook so that we look at um, a wider set of advisors, a wider set of uh, playbooks. For example, we have written a D2C playbook, right? Which is saying, look, um, uh, if you've got a D2C business, how can you really scale better and use less money in scaling up? So how can we refine that? So there is active uh, discussion going on at first side, saying how can we uh, you know, completely relook at all the playbooks and then think about how to strengthen it. All. So would it be fair to say the 10 to 100 journey is about two things from what I understand. Uh, one is uh, distribution. So like all the marketplaces, making sure that those listings are optimized and there is uh, uh, like uh, customers uh, ordering happening through all the marketplaces. And second is about customer acquisition, uh, tweaking that strategy to make it more cost efficient, like through your relationship with Meta and Google. Uh, so you're able to influence the customer acquisition strategy. Uh, that is a substantial part of uh, that uh, journey, which is essentially uh, leveraging the channels leveraging uh, the media options to get acquired customers and hopefully have happy customers. Uh, and then to find product market fit, right? So that's an interesting uh, and important outcome of that. Once we think that the PMF is sort of uh, there, uh, so the 10 to 100 journey itself is sort of uh, that piece, which is about a lot of experimentation. Right? You're putting in a lot of products, you're looking at uh, different uh, options on D2C, et cetera. And you're trying to see where the traction is greater. Uh, once you have that kind of uh, sorted out, then you start thinking about how to focus. And the focus involves two things, which is one about uh, what categories do you really want to spend more money on and where do you want to populate uh, more new products, right? So it's still about experimentation, but that's getting a lot more uh, focus. And the other thing is about starting to think about what is your brand, right? Because so far, if you like, it's all been product. I got supplements, I would launch supplements, etc. And then you're, you're experimenting with advertising. You're, you're doing some influencer stuff. You're doing long form video. You're doing short form video. You're doing a bunch of things. But then once you start thinking brand, then you start thinking about how everything you do falls within what the brand stands for and you start forming your notions around what the brand is about, right? I would say, therefore, it has got both those uh, angles out there. And there is some thought starting to happen around the organization, around how to build the right culture. I find founders who are at that, uh, you know, 50 to 100, getting very clear about what kind of culture is it that they are building and what's going to make it uh, work for them, how to recruit people who uh, are, are a good fit for that culture. So a lot of that thinking is also starting to uh, happen. Um, there is increasing use of data um, and the data about, uh, you know, what is the retention, what kind of cohorts, uh, how to do better uh, retention marketing. 
So there are the use of data starts getting more organized. So this 10 to 100 is actually quite a uh, set of changes happening even within that. Okay. A lot of it is about strengthening your processes, like so that you're able to capture data, analyze data, and uh, able to fix your hiring process and so on. So, okay. Understood. Uh, how do you define product market fit? Uh, you, you know, you said in the 10 to 100 journey is also where companies find product market fit. What is the symptom that tells you that this company has found product market fit? I mean, I think we're looking for a couple of things. One is really about repeat purchase, right? Now, it's a bit of a dodgy one at times because you're on multiple channels and people are not just operating on, buying on one channel. The person who buys on a website may go on to Amazon and buy, etc. So having, within the, within the constraints of that, uh, we still look to see is there a reasonable amount of repeat purchase in a reasonable amount of uh, time. The second piece is clearly the kind of reviews that you're seeing on independent uh, platforms, right? And that tells you a lot. What are people uh, thinking about uh, your brand and so on? The third piece is that at some stage in this journey, we want them, people to do a, a, a brand track, right? We think it's important. Oh, what's uh, a brand track? So a brand track is uh, works at different levels. At one level, it just tells you um, if uh, you, let's say your target audience is defined in a particular way. Let's say you're talking to young women living in um, metros uh, in India. You want to know whether that target consumer uh, is aware of your brand. Okay. And that awareness can be at, again, different levels. You ask, um, which brands of shampoo do you know? And the consumer says, Mama Earth. So that's top of mind. Uh, then she says, I, I know Sun Silk, I know Mama Earth, I know, it's not top of mind, but it's uh, spontaneous. And then it doesn't come there, then you ask the next level, have you heard of Mama Earth? And she says, yes. So it is, then it's, that's a different levels of awareness. So that's one set of uh, things about where the brand stands. Uh, but the other piece is about what do they think of, it, of your brand? And what do they think of your brand in comparison with brands that you think you're competing with, right? And what is it that you want your brand to be known for? If you want your brand to be young, if you want your brand to be seen to be innovative, if you want your brand to be seen to be effective, if your brand, if your brand is for um, modern people, so you write out what you think are the key elements of your brand. And then you figure out, you know, you ask 20 statements to consumers. You name your brand, you name three other brands. And you figure out what they say, yes, this brand stands for these six things. That brand stands for that. And if you are only the same as the other brand, obviously you're not achieve what you wanted to achieve. Right? So you're not getting some sense of innovation, etc. coming through. So there is that whole sense of, uh, you know, are you getting customer love at the product level? And is there some distinctiveness as a brand that is beginning to emerge? Got it. So, so th these three things uh, determine product market fit, like, like they are symptoms of product market fit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, finally, you're also thinking about unit economics. Because if you have achieved product market fit, uh, then are you able to make your advertising pay? Okay. Uh, what does that mean, uh, make your advertising pay? In, this, in the sense that, uh, you know, um, as I said, a lot of consumer products is about repeat purchase. And therefore, you are spending money to acquire a customer in the hope that they buy, come back and buy you again. Now, 100% of people who buy your brand are not going to buy again. But let's say uh, within three months, 30% uh, uh, come back and buy. So your LTV is roughly 1.3 times. And the amount of money you make from your consumers in that 1.3 times, does it co cover your cost of customer acquisition? Okay. Right. So are, are you making money in the lifetime of your customer with you? Okay. Okay, understood. Okay, good. Now, again, that's very important because if you can't, then obviously 
you've got to think again about product market fit. You need them to buy more often. Uh, you need to improve your product. Something you need to do because then your unit economics is not working out. Right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, you are personally working on a 100 to 500 playbook, right, for the Fireside portfolio. Uh, what are some of the insights that uh, you are sharing with the Fireside founders on how to take a... So 100 to 500 essentially means like a company which is at a 100 crore ARR, uh, taking that to a 500 crore ARR, right? So, so what are some of the insights that you are sharing with your portfolio founders? So actually, uh, you know, from our experience uh, with several of our companies now, uh, we have uh, ourselves learned many lessons, right? And that's what is actually playing into this whole 100 to 500 uh, kind of set of practices. Uh, and we've put that across some four or five different uh, work streams. Now, we're not saying that every company needs to do all of that because some companies are already on the journey and doing it very well. So we're looking at each company and then try to figure out when we think about what will drive success, which of these things matter more to a particular company. And therefore, let me give you a flavor of the different uh, work streams. Uh, I think the first one is just organization, right? Uh, and in that piece, I bring in many things. Because obviously building the organization is on the founder's mind right from the time they actually uh, launch a business because you got to buy, find people to do things. But there is an inflection point where the founder himself or herself or as a team are no, no, no longer able to manage the entire team. Uh, and that's when they need to think about themselves uh, as no longer just founders, but also as CEOs. They are not just, you know, um, uh, doing the business, but they're managing the business, right? And that mindset has to change. And along with that, they have to develop new skill sets. Because if you think about it, the skill set which makes for great uh, founders is actually diametrically uh, op opposite of what makes for a great CEO. Just one example, as a great founder, you're in the middle of all the problems, you're solving all the problems. Every problem comes to you and you know how to solve it the best. As a CEO with a team of 300, 400 people, you need to get in uh, other people who perhaps are more skilled than you in solving a problem and you need to allow them to solve the problem. Right, And I can go on, but the whole thing is, how do you build, as a CEO, a scalable organization? How do you stop working on BAU? How do you apply your entrepreneurial energy to levers which you got in your mind, but which are not created? Right? How do you think about the future? And how do you work to creating that future? Right? the future organization, the future business, how do you work towards all of that? How do you step outside the organization? How do you bring in knowledge, practices, wisdom, experiences from outside the organization into the organization? Now, great CEOs do all of that. So you have to re-rudder yourself in so many ways in order to make a create a successful organization. So one of the things we encourage founders to do, and many of them have signed up for it. We say, guys, you need to get on a, leader, a leadership journey, a development journey. Start with great coaching. So get into a coaching engagement to get really ready for the future. It's a zone of discomfort because you suddenly think, am I, am I getting into a psychiatric session kind of thing? Right. But the good founders understand what this is about, that th this is about being future ready. And therefore, I need to know what myself a lot better. And that's great because that we know that's the founders that are going to make a big success of their business. And then it's about then how to build the org structure, the L1 team, how to think compensation, how to think about the right processes, how to have 
uh, how to drive culture. Culture doesn't doesn't happen, right? Uh, so a whole lot of other things, but it starts with the founders becoming great CEOs. Uh, the second piece is the whole brand piece. Uh, we talked about it a little earlier. And I think this becomes even more important because finally in um, consumer companies, the value is in uh, great brands. Because that's what customers love. And that's what they come back to buy. Um, and, and therefore, how do you transcend from product to brand? And here the and how do you how do you create an organization which drives that, not just you, right? And this is what a Unilever or a Procter or a L'Oreal or a, you know all the great consumer companies. This is what they excel excel at. Across the globe, they're able to create one view of a brand, right? A Dove in India, a Dove in the US, a Dove in Russia, is all the same, right? And it's a great brand everywhere, right? Though you might think the consumers are so different. So how do you put that toolkit in place, which enables you to continuously manage a brand, compete with the external world, and build market share, keep doing innovations? How do you put that toolkit out there? It's not about just saying, oh, I know what's in my, in my mind what's a great brand. It's about having a, a method to it, right? Uh, a third thing that we think that some of the companies will need to do is get, have more complex uh, channel uh, operations, right? From being digital first or online first, they will need to get into the offline world. How do you help them navigate uh, that? Because it's a very different uh, set of skills which are required to be successful out there. Right, uh, and, and you know, there are lots and lots of things uh, which uh, are required for you to be successful, and there are very few things which are required for you to fail. Right, so how do you help them navigate all of uh, that? Uh, uh, governance, as you scale, your governance has to strengthen, and it's not because I, as an investor, wants that. It's because you as a, a CEO don't want a fraud in your company, right? Or don't want half your team leaving you tomorrow because they're unhappy with you and your business plans collapse, right? So how do you strengthen your governance mechanisms, right? To build you know, a, a stronger uh, strategy, stronger ways of uh, you know, uh, responding to situations, and so that the external world sees you for what you are, a very strong organization, right? And the whole planet first sustainability piece, how does it continue to grow as the organization grows? Because your impact on the planet is going to get more and more, right? And I think last area we want to work on is technology. Yeah. Uh, this again is something I think very interesting. And this is not just about saying, put in place ERP, et cetera. It's about saying there is so much of data uh, in the world, in the, the, on the web and so on. Is there a way you can do, you can use the data to get more competitive, right? So a bit more of uh, tech for sensing, right? So lots of things, and we're trying to see how to drive this in a programmatic way with companies, but customized to each company's uh, specific context. How are, uh, uh, how are these insights shared? Is it like you share a, like a, 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 like a piece of text with them, like some writing about it, or is it through like a mentorship call or what is the way in which uh, these insights are shared with the portfolio companies? How, how do you help them to actually imbibe? So so uh, the way we have done it is uh, two ways. Um, I, I have gone and met each one of these uh, founders, though it may not be a, a company on which uh, I am on the board of. So I, I spent time, and I'm not talking about what are the numbers of the last month, etc. I'm talking about the organization. I'm talking about their thinking. I'm talking about where they're taking the business to. 
what is working, what's not working, etc. So it's a very, uh, very different kind of conversation. And I'm trying to understand really, therefore, when I think of all the things that I think make for a successful org, what is already out there versus what is not out there. Okay? So it's my, uh, if you like, my audit, right? Uh, and then I come to the partner who is on the deal and the deal team. And I say, look, this is what I've observed, this is what I've understood, is it right? Okay, uh, so I get a validation from some people who are more deeply involved. Okay, and uh, then we come to what we think are the right interventions, right? So then we sit down, there is a, there is a 100 to 500 team, there is a, a, a deal team, and we sit down and say, okay, this is, I think, the set of interventions that perhaps company A requires. Then the deal team goes back to a company and says, okay, this is, I think, what we think. What do you think? Okay. And, you know, we want, obviously, a buy-in. And to extend there is buy-in, we are ready to come in and start talking about uh, each one of those things. We connect them to external uh, partners uh, or, or, you know, any other kind of things. So that's how we work. So there is a process of understanding, confirmation, and buy-in. Mm -hmm. A fairly rigorous process. I, I mean, your portfolio management process by itself is fairly rigorous in terms of helping the portfolio companies to scale up. It is, it is. Uh, and I think that's uh, in our DNA. Uh, hmm. uh, I want to zoom in a little on the sixth uh, work stream you spoke about of technology. Uh, what is like a technology stack for D2C? See, uh, uh, most outsiders would know, okay, Shopify is one tool you use to create your online D2C site. What else is out there that founders should check out? I mean, uh, this is not something I really try to understand deeply, actually. Uh, yes, Shopify. Uh, and, and then I find different people are approaching the whole data piece differently. And uh, right now, some people are uh, actually using data to really, really create a, a very deep understanding of uh, what is working, what is not working, to an extent that they can actually, um, during the course of a day, change the way the sales graph is looking. Okay? Whereas others are more looking at it at sort of at the end of the month or the end of the week, to say, okay, uh, here is my, um, you know, analytics on my media uh, data. This is how my ROAS is a mood. How do I change my, uh, the way I put my media. Uh, and I'm fascinated by how, how much uh, data can be used to really suss out uh, where the consumer is heading to know um, not just what ads are working, but to see which cohort and therefore what you can do better, right? Uh, the other piece which is, is clearly coming to a fore in many, many conversation companies is uh, the relevance of apps, right? Now again, it's an interesting question, when do you launch your app? I mean, the consumer is not going to download each and every app. But at some stage in the life of the uh, brand, it feels like an app is becoming something very uh, important. It's important for uh, acquisition and retention. I always thought an app would be good for retention. But many companies are now saying, look, uh, acquisition is happening on, 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 app, uh, on the app. Um, which I find uh, quite interesting in terms of how consumer behavior on digital media is changing. Uh, the third piece is the whole area of uh, retention, right? And again, lots of uh, work going on with different companies around retention. Uh, 
Uh, people are saying apps are certainly important for uh, retention, but also things like uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp messaging, WhatsApp communities, uh, communities on Meta, communities on uh, within the app. All of these seem to be very good for uh, retention. Yeah. So I think again, it's very uh, specific to uh, the business, but. It's uh, uh, acquisition is just one part of the equation. How you figure out the retention is very important. And I think lots of different things going on in uh, companies too, to figure that uh, out uh, as, as well. All right. Got it. Um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, in the uh, offline, going offline uh, piece that you spoke about, uh, how does one decide whether to do general trade or modern trade, you know, between these two? Or should both be done at the same time? Or what's the way to think about going offline? So here is my view. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I, I actually put it out as three clusters. One is the national modern trade. Yeah. The second is uh, the local uh, modern trade which is a large um, supermarket uh, markets, some of which are local chains, other which are just standalone. And then you have the, um, what I would call general trade, which is the Kirana stores, the, um, uh, the, the fancy stores, the uh, chemist outlets and so on. So the national chains, um, it, it's, it's a complex org structure. Uh, and navigating that is not easy um, because you need to uh, get the brand listed. Uh, listing is going to be expensive. For that, you need to negotiate again with the category team, which is at the center, right? Then you need to work with the regional teams, and the regional team is not just, let's say, South India, but there is a, a team for South India, then there is a team for Chennai, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to get orders released, right? And then you need to have uh, a support system to make sure the orders get executed. Then you need to, you know, have a, a way of reconciling accounts with the modern trade to collect your money, et cetera. So there is a complexity involved out here, which uh, many firms are not equipped to answer, to, to deal with. Uh, the general trade is, uh, again, a, a different uh, kettle of fish because their discovery becomes very difficult. So if your brand is already well-known and the consumer is going to go and ask for it, then okay, you could go into a Kerala and put a, some stuff out there. Um, and the guy will probably, uh, if it's on credit, he will keep it. And when it sells, he will pay you for it. right? But you're not going to find brand discovery happening out there. Unless, again, you put a lot of POP and stuff like that. The other piece, of course, are general traders that the, uh, the kind of, um, the, the amount of uh, business you can generate per outlet is going to be quite small. You need to have, therefore, a lot more feet on the street. And therefore, the cost of uh, order acquisition is going to be large, right? So I think if what works better is the, a local modern trade. Uh, and again, within that, there are some chains where have, there are more complex structures, the listing fees are high, etc. But by and large, this is the place where you're going to find that, uh, you know, the discovery of your brand can be easier. Uh, you still need to activate the brand. You can't just put it on the shelf and just say the consumer will find it. You need to spend some money on activating it. But hopefully you'll find that uh, the store owner is more receptive to keeping a new brand. Yes, he's also going to say, sell the product that I will pay, right? But at least there's much better chances of success. Plus the consumer who comes to such a store would be relatively more affluent. Would relatively, would be more affluent, uh, would perhaps be more digitally exposed. Mm. So might have seen your brand on digital media, have some familiarity with it, would read back copy, right? Uh, and if there is a promoter out there talking a bit about what is the narrative of the brand, more willing to listen and understand. 
Yeah. All right. So my last question to you, uh, which is your favorite company in your portfolio? <laughs> That's like asking a father who's your favorite child. <laughs> Akshay, you know, <laughs> it's so yeah. difficult to know where to start yeah. and where to, you know, stop in all of mm. this. I already talked to you about so many of my favorite brands about uh, Mammoth and uh, Yoga Bar and Kapiva, Wellbeing, you know, Thraya is uh, such an interesting business, which is into hair loss. Uh, they're doing some amazing uh, work. Uh, Smitten is actually a very different kind of business where they're doing uh, online sampling. And they are actually, therefore, not a product business, but they're a service business. They are actually looking at how to completely disrupt the way uh, FMCG companies uh, do marketing. Because FMCG companies spend a lot of money on uh, sampling. And these guys have just made it easy for them to do targeted sampling online and to understand how successful the sampling is by having an e-commerce platform where consumers who get a sample can choose to buy the full product uh, on the e-commerce platform. Now they're offering, based on all the data they have, actually a consumer research platform to FMCG companies and a, an advertising platform to consumer companies. So that's a very, very interesting uh, business. And I want to tell you one more company which I really love. Again, it's something that um, I've recently come on the board of. Uh, this is uh, a, 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 an IP-based business. It's called, uh, the brand is called Inito. Okay. And um, uh, this is the first really solidly IP-based uh, business that we invested in. IP developed in uh, India. And they market... Um, uh, diagnostic kits and sell largely in the US. So this is created in India for the globe kind of thing. And um, this kit that they have right now in the market is for women who are trying to conceive, right? And therefore they can uh, track their hormone levels, know when is the right time for them to be able to conceive, or they actually can map out several hormones on that one strip on which their reading is, uh, you know, checked. And they can figure out if any of the hormones are not as, as they should be. They can then decide to go to a gynec, right? All of which becomes very, very important in, in a market like the US where, uh, you know, medical care is expensive and something like this is not covered by insurance. So they have, kind of, and they got a whole lot of other uh, DIY kits coming in, uh, all based on, uh, uh, you know, Indian IP. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, you know, I interviewed Swagat, the founder of Smitten. Uh, I, I felt that this was not a frugal capital business. I mean, if you're building e-commerce in a way, you're competing with Amazon and Flipkart. Uh, so I was a little surprised that you love it so much. <laughs> No, you're, you're, you're uh, right that to acquire that whole uh, base of uh, app users uh, is expensive, right? But they're coming to a stage now where they are now uh, leveraging that to create uh, insights for FMCG companies. And that is very frugal on capital. Right, yeah. Because uh, the database has been created Obviously, you need to keep expanding it. You need to keep refreshing it. But that doesn't need to happen at the same pace as it has happened all along. And then the, the inside piece is, is actually a very different uh, kind of business. 